I'm going to talk uh, today about a little bit more about detection. And then in the next lectures, uh, we're going to uh, go on to see uh, how we do parameter estimation and uh, extract science from uh, detections once they are made. So, well, oh, I have this slide that is left over from a completely different lecture. Uh, but anyway, so I might as well. So, you know, in linearized uh, general relative, you know, let me just skip this. You know this, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let me also skip this because it's somewhat outdated, although, well, you know, people, and Peter Salson probably already talked about this, the way people thought uh, they wanted to detect gravitational waves at first in the 70s already uh, was using resonant detectors. And then, of course, uh, be, being coming from the Netherlands, I have to showcase then the mini grail in Leiden. But anyway, so this is really how we're going to do it uh, for real. Uh, so, uh, well, a quick recap, uh, no doubt. Peter Salson will have uh, explained all this. So uh, the gravitational wave has a sort of tidal effect. Um, and the idea is we have this interferometer. I'm not going to explain about the beam splitting and, and the resonant cavities and so on and so forth. Uh, but in any case, uh, the, 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 the point is one arm periodically becomes lo longer and the other one shorter, and this has an influence on this interference pattern. Um, but uh, going on then, um, and going on still, uh, you can characterize the response of, well, so basically what, what okay, so s suppose a gravitational wave comes by, <laughs> typically it will not be coming from directly overhead or directly underfoot, because of course gravitational waves can pass straight through the Earth. That would also be detectable. Um, but <coughs> um, basically, uh, you know, given you know a detector that's sitting there with a particular orientation, um, of course you will only be sensitive to the components of this Hij, which is the gravitational wave, in directions along the x-axis and the y-axis as drawn here, namely the directions uh, along the, the arms. And then, what, so the strain measured in, in the interferometer is one half of the x-x component of this uh, Hij tensor minus the, the y-y component. So that is for an L-shaped detector. And then uh, since we're also thinking about V-shaped detectors with 60 degree opening angles, like in the case of Einstein telescope, if you remember, uh, <coughs> you can generalize this. So, okay, f for L-shaped detectors where, you know, there's an x-axis and perpendicular to it is a y-axis along the two arms. This is what the strain is. More generally, if you have uh, a V-shaped detector, then you can still define um, a unit vector U and a unit vector V uh, pointing along the two arms. And then again, uh, you'll see that the strain is one half H, now the UU component minus H VV component. Um, and so, uh, more generally, you can write this in terms of a so-called detector tensor, uh, which you're going to contract which, with, with uh, Hij to find the strain um, that you measure with the interferometer. And the detector tensor is then just, of course, one half of, well, two copies of this unit vector u minus two copies of this unit vector v. And you'll see immediately, I think, that what comes out is, is, is this here. Um, OK, so going on still. <coughs> Um, you also no doubt already know now that um, if you have a gravitational wave propagating in the z direction, and this is the, the z, the z there are several z axes here, but I'm talking now about this z axis, which is the direction of propagation, then in the transverse uh, traceless gauge, this is what this Hij perturbation looks like. So, so it is, uh, um, it is uh, transverse, so you know, there's no components in the direction of the propagation. It is traceless, so whatever is here has to be minus whatever is here. And it is symmetric, so what is here has to be exactly equal to what is here. So, okay, but that, that is Hij, you know, in a frame that is um, um, uh, adapted to the propagation of motion. Um, so, now, uh, if, the, if the gravitational wave is coming from directly overhead or from directly underfoot, <laughs> then um, uh, it, it is easy to see that the, the strain measured in the interferometer will be just the, the, you know, the plus polarization. But in general, of course, what you were what the strain you will measure will be some linear combination of the plus and the cross uh, polarizations. Um, in fact, um, in general, you need to do two things to get to the, the strain 
uh, so the output therefore of your interferometer. So the first thing you want to do is take your HIJ in uh, the simple form um, at, uh, uh, in a frame uh, adapted to the, the propagation and transform it um, to a different coordinate system, namely a frame that is uh, adapted to the detector and th those are the red axis here, x axis, y axis, z axis. So that means you perform two linear operations, basically you, you have two rotation matrices acting on uh, HKL um, um, uh, because, well, H has two indices simply. Um, and that will give you HIJ in a frame X, Y, Z that is adapted to the interferometer. And then you still have to um, contract with the detector tensor to finally get the strain H of T. Okay, so that means that to get from um, the form of H HIJ in a frame adapted to, to the propagation, to the strain, you have to perform three linear operations. You contract with uh, two copies of this rotation matrix that associates the magenta uh, uh, frame uh, with, or um, yeah, associates the uh, magenta frame with the red frame, and then finally contraction with uh, this detector tensor. Now, you have a succession of three linear operations, so that means that the strain will always be a linear combination of the plus and the cross components up here. And so, well, the, what we, so the coefficients in that, linear, in that linear combination, we call the, antenna, the, uh, the beam pattern functions or the, the antenna pattern functions. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, that for detector. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this HIJ in this detector frame, that is the red uh, coordinate system, and then uh, the, the HKL N hat equals Z hat is just, you know, in the, in the frame adapted to uh, direction of propagation. So, okay, we, what, we, what, we get is, what we get as an output uh, from our detector is therefore some linear combination of the two polarizations of the gravitational wave. Um, and, um, of course, the coefficients have to uh, depend on, first of all, where the gravitational wave came from because th that will be... Um, uh, you know what? Oops. Whatever that, uh, whatever direction it came from, will of course be present in this rotation matrix here. That's clear. Um, <coughs> so uh, these beam pat pattern functions, first of all, will uh, depend on angles theta and phi, which are just the sky position. But more than that, they also depend on <coughs> what we call the polarization angle psi. And so uh, to visualize the polarization angle, what you could uh, imagine is that, um, so here is the X, the X prime, Y prime frame, that is the, the frame uh, adapted to the gravitational wave. And usually there is, um, you know, more of the plus polarization and less of the cross polarization at a given um, uh, point in time. So basically you could imagine drawing this, let's say this, this is uh, the horizon and this is part of a great circle and this is the sky location that the gravitational wave come, came from, then you can imagine the, the effect of the gravitational wave having you know, a, a particular direction that it, that, it, that it is mostly associated with. And then that particular direction, if you take the angle with this great circle here, that is simply this polarization angle to psi. So, this is how we uh, get from the H plus and H cross polarizations in that gravitational wave adapted frame to what is actually the output uh, of the detector. And it is, uh, uh, well, a not nice exercise to show that indeed the, these, this, these are the forms of F plus and F cross and you don't have to do it. Um, besides, we have Mathematica now, right? Uh, yesterday I inadvertently uh, made advertisement for Mathematica. So. Um, Okay, so from now on, we're just going to assume that, uh, well, we, we know how the detector responds and uh, what, we, what we are now mostly interested in is simply, well, what comes out, this H of T. Um, <coughs> and um, so if there is an H of T present in the first place, if there is a signal present in the first place, we want to dig it out. 
And uh, for the purposes of this lecture, we will not be so much interested in uh, the precise parameters of the signal. First of all, let's see if we can detect the signal in the first place. And then again, in the, in the coming lectures, we're going to try and see uh, um, what kind of science or actually what kind of information about the source we can extract. Now, um, if there is a signal, then uh, this, the measured strain, what you, know, what you actually get as a data stream from the detector, will not just be that signal, there will also be a noise component. Okay? And we'll have to deal with that in some way. And usually, in fact, the noise is going to be you know, totally overwhelming uh, the signal. This is true of uh, the advanced... Yeah. No, they add linearly. Um, yes, it, well, in reality, there will be, but fortunately, it will be small. So uh, you can imagine things like uh, a gravitational wave signal is coming by, and okay, it affects the positions of, of mirrors, and because of some imperfection uh, in the instrument, the, the mirrors start resonating at, at different frequencies from each other, something like that. So nonlinear effects like that, like that are to be and but they are reasonably expected on engineering grounds to be small. So the approximation I make here, that's a very good point actually, but the approximation I'm, I'm, I'm making here is probably going to be a good one, good enough for the purposes of detection. Well, you could have an n times h uh, contribution to the detector output, and in, in practice that is actually to be expected. It is just that it will be small. So basically you are the, there will be nonlinear non 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 coupling as well and that between is noise and. Uh, you are saying that is resolved by good engineering. You can't do anything if you have that sort of data. Uh, well, yes, you probably can do something, okay. but again, the effect will be small, so we'll, we'll, we'll treat it as uh, some very small perturbation. Um, right, so. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to assume, therefore, that the measured strain is actually simply a, a sum of noise and, and signal. Um, now, uh, if the shape of the signal is approximately known, then you can dig it out more easily, and that is the whole idea of match filtering that I already you know, roughly described yesterday. And here is the, the rough idea again, but now a little bit more concrete. What you do is you take your detector output, S of T, and you multiply with the expected signal h of t and you integrate over whatever time is relevant. In the case of transient signals, capital T here is just the length of the signal. In the case of um, continuous waves, it is the length of the observation time. That is the length of your data set. And you divide by t, well, you know, for good measure because uh, you'll end up with something that is dimensionless again. Um, then, um, so what happens? Uh, well, again, you know, the S of T will have two components in it. It will have a noise component and H of T itself. So you get two terms in this integral. And incidentally, I'm assuming here implicitly that for whatever reason, I uh, know that a signal of a particular very definite shape will or will not be present in the data. This is what at first I will uh, assume. Of course, in reality, that is not true. In reality, I know that, for instance, signals from compact, compact binary coalescence, among many other parameters, are determined by the component masses. But we'll get to that later. For now, I'm going to assume that, miraculously, I know already what parameters, uh, what source parameters to expect, and therefore what signal to expect, if a signal is present. So the, the aim here is only to, you know, to figure out whether or not that particular signal is present, yes or no. Yeah. So, uh, I didn't understand. So, you are neglecting n times h kind of effects in first equation, but like you are keeping these terms here? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not keeping them here. The, the, the thing is that. No, no, uh, but like you have a combination here. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. N yeah. H, yeah. So yeah. Okay, yeah. The, the way it is different is that uh, I, I simply substitute here my S of t, and then, of course, you'll, you'll get an n times h term because of the h I'm, I'm multiplying with, the h I'm filtering with, right? And also an h squared term, which is the signal that I think is maybe present, 
multiply it with the template again that I'm filtering with. So that's the, so the, the, this is not nonlinear, right? not not nonlinearity. I'm deliberately multiplying my detector output with some HFT that I expect to be present, or maybe not. So so I'm straightforwardly substituting here the detector output in here. That, that's all for for now. That's all. Yeah. <coughs> so. Now we have two uh, factors, and well, um, the, the two factors are qualitative, or the two terms rather, are qualitatively different. Uh, the second one here has an integrand that is positive definite. So it's just, as you integrate, it's just going to grow, right? Here, on the other hand, well, the noise is just squiggles. H of T itself typically is also just squiggles, only of a rather more definite form. But you expect the integrand here to be rather oscillatory, uh, and uh, not to build up, or at least not build up as quickly as the second term here. And in fact, you can sort of uh, make a crude estimate of what that first term is going to be like compared to the second term. So the second term, um, I'm going to wave my hands frantically here, right? So, so if you ask a detailed question, I'll fail miserably. The detailed answer or the detailed way of doing things actually will come in, in subsequent slides, okay? I'm waving my hands. So, <laughs> so I first look at the second term. So the second term is this integrand here. Um, and now I'm going to say, well, how large do I expect this uh, integral to be in the end? Well, I'm going to say the typical size of H, the, the typical amplitude over the duration of the signal is H naught. Let's call that H naught. Well, then that integral is roughly going to go like H naught squared and then times time because of this integral here, but time is divided out again. So the second term here goes like H naught squared. Okay. Now, the first term there, um, well, you could model it in, in many different ways, but most of you will, will have heard of uh, random walk, right? Uh, yes, okay. So the first term, actually, you, you could expect it to go a bit like a random walk. And um, so you, you probably know that um, if it is a random walk in the sense of a diffusing gas or a random walk in the, in the sense of the funny example with uh, the drunk person and, and the, the, the lamppost. Do you know that example? Of, yeah. So the drunk person walks into a lamppost. If he does, then he turns back. If he misses the next one, he keeps going until he hits the lamppost again and then he turns back and so on. And so the, 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 the person will get away, on average, will get away from his starting point um, uh, as the square root of time. Okay. So the integrand here, so the way we expect that to grow is with the square root of uh, time. And then, of course, the, the result will have to be proportional roughly to this H naught, which uh, is you know, the, the rough size of the signal, but also proportional to N naught, which is the rough size of well, the noise. Um, so that is, what you, that is what you get for integral 0 to t. Um, N of t, h of t, dt. It'll go uh, roughly like this. But then you divide by t. Oops. So you get division by t. Now I get 1 upon square root t, uh, n naught, h naught. Hang on, this cannot be right. Because this, this is dimensionful. Well, this, this as a whole is dimensionless, right? Because n, not, uh, n is dimensionless. H, the strain, is definitely dimensionless. You have a dimension of time here, but a division by time here. <coughs> well, so again, hand-wavingly, I need another um, um, time scale here, which I call tau naught. And what other time scale is there in the problem? <coughs> well, it is the typical period of the signal. There is no other time scale. There is no such thing as a typical period of the noise, because the noise is not periodic. right? So this is roughly how I expect this uh, first term to go now. And now I can compare these two terms with each other. So, okay, so to repeat, tau naught is the uh, period of the gravitational wave signal. <coughs> H naught is the characteristic si signal amplitude, whatever that means. And um, N naught is the characteristic amplitude of the noise. So what does that or what do we infer from that? In order to detect a signal, what we need is the second term being larger than the first term. 
Well, interestingly, to detect the signal by that um, re uh, requirement, you don't need the characteristic signal amplitude to be larger than the characteristic noise amplitude. What you need instead is simply for this to be larger than that, which means that you need H0 to be larger than this tau naught to the one half times characteristic amplitude of the noise, which is a very different statement, of course. Uh, because let's, let's consider some example, examples. If you have binary coalescences, then the typical period of uh, the signal um, is um, uh, 10 to the minus 2 second, seconds, uh, or at least um, you know, the part of the signal that is visible in the detector um, will, will have that uh, property more or less, because the detector is most sensitive at 100 hertz, remember? So 1 upon 100 hertz, that's 10 to the minus 2 seconds. Um, the, the, the capital T is the length of the signal. Um, for a binary neutron star being optimistic about, you know, how, how, uh, about the, the frequency range of my detector, I'm going to say it's going to be in my detector for 100 seconds. So, well, I compose this quantity here and I find 10 to the minus 2. That's great because that means that I can have a characteristic signal amplitude that is 100 times smaller than the characteristic noise amplitude and I can still dig it out of the noise. So that's extremely good news, right? Because really for second generation detectors, we do uh, expect most of the time the signal to be totally swamped by the noise. Another example is uh, continuous waves from, for instance, millisecond pulsars. Um, then I'm going to say, well, the characteristic period of my signal is about a millisecond, right? And then what is capital T? Well, again, you know, continuous waves, they are on always. So my only constraint on uh, how long I, I I, I can measure is how long the uh, experimentalists keep the detector on before they want to switch it on again to make a better one. And let's say that is in the order of a year. So then in this case, uh, character, so the square root of the characteristic uh, um, period of the signal divided my, by my observation time, that is 10 to the minus 5. So in other words, for a continuous signal, um, of this kind, of course, um, the uh, signal amplitude can be 100 times, 100,000 times smaller than the characteristic amplitude of the noise, and I'll still be able to dig out my signal. So that is, so that qualitatively at least explains um, what I was saying uh, yesterday when I was making. Um, um, well, statements like, oh, you know, if a signal is on all the time, you can integrate over the entire observation time and then, you know, <laughs> dig a lot deeper into uh, the noise. And that, that is quantified uh, in this way then. Okay. Um, but let's n now uh, largely drop the hand waving. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering in your previous slide, if there's any way to see from this equation that if your template and your signal don't actually match how we would lose out on the We'll get to that. Yeah. OK. So um, now we make things a li little bit more realistic, and we're going to move towards what is actually done in reality, which is not the integral that was on the, on the previous slide. Um, so first of all, we, we need to know a few things about the noise, or at least uh, define some, some things about the noise. Um, if only noise is coming out of your detector, then the um, the detector output is simply the the noise at some time t naught and the noise at some time t one and so on because the the noise will be discreetly or the detector output in general will be discreetly sampled. Now, uh, very often it will be uh, convenient to take a Fourier tra transform and then you might just as well talk about a whole bunch of numbers which are now uh, functions of uh, uh, frequency, you know, evaluated at a frequency F0, frequency F1, and so on, which again will be equal equally spaced. Um, now, an important point is that, th this is only noise, but an important point is that some realizations of the noise are more probable than others. And now, in each of these frequency bins, let's, let's uh, continue uh, thinking in terms of uh, frequency bins rather than time bins, because it will turn out to be uh, uh, more convenient. Uh, so for each of these frequency bins, um, you should be able to write down a probability distribution for the noise. Okay? <coughs> now, an important assumption that we're going to make is that in each of the frequency bins, the noise is stationary and Gaussian. Neither of those assumptions in reality. And we'll get to the effect of this not being true in later slides. 
However, for now we assume this, so that means simply that the probability distribution in each uh, frequency bin goes like a Gaussian, which will have some uh, spread, sigma sub i, and then you have uh, modulus squared of uh, noise at frequency i, simple, simply. Um, uh, and, uh, very important, the spread of this Gaussian can be different from one frequency bin to the next, and in fact that is what you expect, right? Because we keep drawing or showing these, uh, these plots for the detector sensitivity um, as a function of frequency. So, uh, well, let me not yet put something on the y-axis because I'll be, more, uh, be able to be more careful uh, in, in a moment. And then we say, oh, we, we will reach 10 to the minus 23 or even better, depending on the detector. Well, you know, you, if, if this is roughly the noise, you can already see, well, there's a lot more noise at this frequency, typically, uh, and also at this frequency, than there is here, right? So, okay, we can assume that uh, in every uh, frequency bin, the noise is Gaussian distributed, but what we shouldn't assume is that the spread of the Gaussian is the same in every frequency bin. Okay, <coughs> now, uh, so if the noise is stationary in Gaussian, then, uh, well, uh, two things follow immediately. So one thing is that, um, if you uh, take the expectation value of the noise in a particular frequency bin, um, then you get zero. And what is the expectation value? Well, it is just you integrate the noise against <coughs> its, its probability distribution. That is what expectation value means, right? So, and uh, for a Gaussian, which is centered on zero, you get zero. Um, no miracle here. And then you can also uh, compute the variance, which is the expectation value of this, uh, the square of the noise, essentially which is given by this expression here, and that is just this uh, uh, variance sigma that, ap that appears in my Gaussian. Again, no great mysteries here. And then you can consider the probability density for a noise realization as a whole. And a noise real realization as a whole means you have uh, some n, you know, noise n in the zeroth frequency, zero frequency bin, some other value of the noise in the first frequency bin, and so on. Well, um, assuming that the noise, is the noise in all of these frequency bins, assuming that the noise is independent in all these bins, which is again uh, not a light assumption, but we'll make it uh, for now, then the probability for a noise realization is simply the product of the probabilities for the noise in all of the different frequency bins. Okay. This is, an ensemble, this is like an ensemble averaging. Uh, however, uh, note that this is only a one-dimensional integral, right? Because uh, we, we're looking at the noise at one particular frequency. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, so this is what we have for now. We have the probability density for, the, for a noise realization as a whole, meaning noise at frequency F0, noise at frequency F1, and so on, where all these frequencies are equally spaced. So, then if the noise is stationary and Gaussian, well, that product um, gives me um, something like a Gaussian again. Uh, so, uh, since uh, each of these uh, little p's here are Gaussians, the arguments of in the exponents are just going to add up, and this is what I get. Now, for the, for the purpose of this lecture, it will be convenient to take the continuum limit, although, of course, th this is not what you do in practice. Again, in practice, you have a d discrete sampling of your detector output. However, uh, the taking the continuum limit will make it easier to understand concepts such as signal-to-noise ratio and, and chi-squared, whatever comes next. So, taking the continuum limit, that's not uh, difficult. So, what we do is we introduce a delta f. We multiply in here in the uh, exponent. We multiply and divide by some delta f, which we want to become a df in an integral in the continuum limit. And, um, well, that means we combine the sigma i squared delta f into one quantity, and we take the continuum limit. So that means that what happens to the variance is that, well, the variance gets multiplied by this delta f in the continuum limit. This becomes some function. Or if you write this uh, in another way, if you throw this delta f to the right-hand side, uh, you see that the variance in each frequency bin goes to um, some delta function between frequencies, because this is approximately 1 upon delta f, times that same function, SN of f. And SN of f is called the noise spectral density. 
SNFF, uh, a, a simple calculation will show, is indeed the noise autocorrelation. And by the noise autocorrelation, I mean this here. So this is the expectation value of um, NFF and NFF prime, so noise at two different frequencies, except that uh, I put a star here for complex conjugate. Uh, let's not you know, uh, dwell on, the, on that sort of technical technicalities here. The point is, if you take this uh, expectation value here, that is, again, you take an ensemble average, so you take an integral of this quantity against the probability density for the noise, for noise realizations. So if you take that integral, what you get is a delta function times this function SNFF. And so this SNFF is then called the noise spectral density. Why? Because um, if the delta function, so, well, let me write what is, what is actually there. On the left-hand side, I have this expectation value until the star of f, uh, until the f prime. And this expectation value, I claim, is equal to a delta function, f minus f prime, time, times one-half Sn of f. <coughs> okay, so if I let f go to f prime, then the right-hand side blows up, of course. But suppose that this delta function weren't here, then you see that um, the variance of the noise is proportional to this function Sn of f. And so in, and for that reason, people call this the noise spectral density. And this, this quantity Sn of f, or actually the square root of it, is also what people plot when they want to show the sensitivity of a detector at different frequencies. So when people make this plot, uh, with the 10 to the minus 23 or whatever over here and frequency here, what is on the y-axis is the square root of Sn of f. Why the square root? Because Sn of f itself goes like the noise squared and I rather want, oops, if I want to have a feel for what amplitudes I'm going to be sensitive to, I want to take the square root of that. That means I also take the square root here. Okay, so that is that. So now we have uh, a formula for a prob the probability density of, for noise realizations. Um, and I also have this um, uh, notion of um, noise spectral density, which is basically the variance of the noise as a function of frequency. <coughs> and then, well, this I can probably skip. We could also have worked in the time domain. And then, well, stationarity would have meant that, OK, you, you can again take an expectation value that uh, uh, comes out to be 0. And then stationarity and Gaussianity together mean that uh, the probability density for n on noise re re realizations is completely determined by this autocorrelation function in uh, the time domain this time. Um, and then uh, you could get you could again obtain the noise power spectral density simply as a Fourier transform of this time domain autocorrelation. So qualitatively, none of this will come as a surprise, probably. Um, and then you find again that in the frequency do domain, what I'm going to call the noise autocorrelation up to a delta function is the power spectral density. So, you know, in a sense, these are just, you know, ver you, you, you formulate very simple assumptions and then you see what flows from it. So far, I haven't done much. Um, but now let's, let's try to do something more interesting. And that is, um, let's see um, how we can optimally get a signal out of the noise if one is present. So before, what we were doing was an extremely simple, thi simple thing. We were assuming that, um, well, if a signal is present, then we know how it, how it squiggles, how it wiggles. Um, so we know what H of T is somehow. Well, um, and, and then we see that, you know, the, the uh, part of the detector output that contains the signal leads to an integral that grows, whereas uh, integrating a, sing a signal template against uh, the noise gives you something that, is, that doesn't grow as fast. It is oscillatory. However, you know, in, in the integral, we so it's still on, no, it's not, not, no longer on the board, but in the integral, the simple integral I wrote earlier, where we take the detector output and we integrate against some h of t, we weren't actually doing an optimal thing because we weren't making use of the properties of our detector. We have a lot more knowledge than the possible um, shape of the signal, right? And that is what we now want to fold in. So we want to, to take, so we want to integrate something against the data again, 
But it's, it's not just going to be waveforms, although waveforms will ha waveform templates will have to be involved in some way or the other. Um, but I also want to make use of the fact that I kind of know what my detector output in terms of noise look, looks like. In particular, I know what this curve is. I can even measure this curve. Now you know how. You simply uh, compute this quantity here from whatever output you get. Right? So, uh, and I want to fold that information in uh, to come up with what I'm going to call a filter that I will integrate against the data. And that will turn out to be uh, 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 you know, a more clever way of digging a signal out of noise. Now, um, uh, before going on, so, well, this, this is just an expression, but before going on, I need two more definitions. I, I'm going to call this quantity here, the filter that I, I don't know what it is yet, that I'm going to integrate against the noise, I call that quantity S hat. Okay. Now, I'm going to define two more quantities, a capital S, capital N, and I define S, capital S, to be the expectation value of this S hat in the event that the signal is present. And you compute expectation values simply by integrating against the probability density of noise realizations, right? So that is always what the, these angular brackets are going to mean. The other quantity, capital N, is the root mean square value of this, this guy here in the event that no signal is present. So I just take um, uh, the variance of uh, this quantity in the event that no signal is present, and I subtract uh, the, the square of uh, the average and take the square root of that. Now, the ratio of those two, by definition, is the signal-to-noise ratio. So the signal-to-noise ratio is the expectation value of this filtering integral in the event that no signal is present, divided by its RMS, its RMS value in the event that no signal is present. That's a particular choice we make. Later on, we'll see that it's a particularly interesting choice. It, in retrospect, we'll see, because this signal-to-noise ratio will be directly related to something people call likelihood. And already the name likelihood suggests, oh, something interesting to do with probabilities that's probably going to be relevant. And this will be the case. But for now, I just present you with, well, what, what is you know, a relatively arbitrary, uh, a rather arbitrary uh, definition. But yeah. Yes, uh, b you integrate against the probability density uh, for noise realizations, which is again uh, this guy here in the continuum uh, limit. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, so always when I have the angular brackets, it means you integrate against that probability density. That's right. So now, yes. Uh, yeah, certainly, so, yes, that's true. Uh, fix it from the beginning because I thought, and, and you see uh, uh, how much noise or how much data is <coughs> Yeah. Because if you integrate over it a longer time, and so, so you uh, can do more data, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, certainly that's true. But, but you know, those, so, so the time you, you, inter you can ind integrate over, is set by how much data has been taken right before the detector was switched off and then m further improvements were made to the detector, then it was switched on again. That is something the data analyst has little power over. Yes, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, but, but the, so, yeah, good question. Well, this quantity is not only going to depend on the integration time, because this filter here will depend both on the signal and its strength, therefore, also, and it will depend on the properties of the detector, that is, whatever the, the, the noise curve was during the data taking time, or actually during the, for the duration of, that the signal was in the detector in practice. So, so the, and, and for now, not much is fixed yet, right? So what, what, what will certainly be the case is that S, or actually the, this quantity here, the signal-to-noise ratio, will depend on the observation time. It will also depend on the length in time of the signal, if, if one is going to be present in the detector. It will depend on the uh, properties of the detector during the data-taking time. And it will depend on uh, the kind of signal templates that I have to my disposal, even. 
because uh, I, I will have some, you know, the knowledge of, of uh, the kind of signal that's going to come to me um, will in some way be limited, right? If, it is, if, if I expect a signal from a compact binary coalescence, you already know that the waveform is not exactly known because the two-body problem in GR has no exact solution. I will have some, uh, some approximation to my signal, which hopefully will be a very good one, but still. So this, this signal-to-noise ratio, it's true, is going to depend on uh, quite a number of factors. <coughs> and you, but you can tease those apart, actually. And part of that I will show later on. Um, and now, so the aim of the game is going to be, um, well, okay, I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to simply uh, integrate in against some trial waveform, what I'm, because I want to fold in some information I have about the detector as well. But then, okay, what should I choose for KFT now? That is, that is now the question. So, which is the same as saying, now that I've defined my signal-to-noise ratio, um, what choice of filter maximizes that signal-to-noise ratio, given the kind of signals I expect, given the kind of detector I have, given the length of the, of the data taking, and so on and so forth. What, what, what form, function form, K of T, maximizes the signal-to-noise ratio? Okay. So, I have the signal-to-noise ratio, which again, for now, I mean, it's, it's only a definition. And then uh, I have this expression uh, where I take the detector output and I integrate against some filter, which, uh, you know, I've yet to determine what it should be, such that the signal-to-noise ratio is maximal. First, I'm, I want to rewrite uh, this capital S and capital N in a more convenient form which will turn out to be uh, in the Fourier domain. So I'm going to take Fourier transforms, as we'll see later on. Well, almost, every, almost anything in data, analysis, uh, in data analysis is easier in the Fourier domain, um, or easier to understand in any case. So what I do is I, I take my definition of S again. Remember, capital S is just the expectation value of this integral here in the event that the signal is present. Well, uh, taking an expectation value is going to move through that integral. And since my filter here is just a function of time, it, it knows nothing about the noise, the expectation value is just acting on this S of t here. Right? And so it's only S of t that gets integrated, or separately it gets integrated against uh, the, the probability density over noise realizations. Now, um, um, the assumption here is that a signal is present. So S of t is really N of t plus H of t, where N of t is the noise. But since I assume stationary Gaussian noise, the expectation value of N of t is zero. So this expectation value of S of t is just H of t, nothing more. Okay? It is the signal that I expect to be there. And then, well, the next thing I do is simply... Sorry, yeah. Yeah, well, the denominator, as it will turn out, is not only uh, determined by the noise, but no, no, uh, yeah, right, because but the filter the appears here. Well, let's let's make it more concrete, right? So, okay, so you have your S, uh, which turns out to be an integral over frequency of the signal that is in the data times well uh, the complex conjugate actually of my filter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because in case of non-Gaussian distribution, the noise distribution, mean of that 
Persecution will not be zero. No, 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 of course. The, the simplifications will not work. Yeah, that, that, that is I'm true. saying you should have, you would have defined like that S by S, yes. sigma noise ratio, a ratio like mean of S yeah. when noise is zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to come to concrete expressions, uh, suppose, let's, let's consider a much simpler case where the noise is stationary but not Gaussian. Okay. Uh, yeah, then, then, then your, well, the, your probability distribution that you use for uh, taking, for you, that you use for, for the angular graphics is of course going to be a different distribution. And you could work with that, right? And then it is not necessarily the case that the expectation value of the noise is zero. That is true. Yeah, absolutely. But the reason why we don't do this in practice is two. So one reason is that, well, um, so first of all, okay, in reality it is true that the, the, the noise is not stationary and not Gaussian, but the good approximation it is over sufficiently long time scales. And you have to have you have to make some simplifying uh, assumption at some point, right? But there's a, there's another thing. So I just said, well, what if the noise is stationary but not Gaussian? Well, then you know, in a given frequency, then maybe this is what the probability density for the noise looks like. But in reality, it is also not stationary, okay? So if, if I look half an hour later, and maybe the probability distribution looks something like this. And the problem becomes complex, you know, extremely quickly, okay? So in, we, we are only humans. Um, so we have to set up some formulas that uh, we can wrap our heads around. And then we can try to make things more complicated later on. And actually, I can, I can give you indications later on of how you can make it more complicated and in fact account for it for non stationary and non Gaussian noise. Actually, I was just bothering about the definition of I mean, <laughs> signal noise ratio. Yeah. So that you should have written mean of edge okay, when, when noise is zero, because in the denominator we have taken signal equals to zero. Uh, I don't see the problem. No, no, uh, there uh, is so no problem. No, no, so, okay, so do, do you agree that if this is taken to be the definition of the signal to noise ratio, then this is what S and N are about. I actually, these are the definitions of S and N. And we agree that uh, this, this last line in each case is what, is what comes out in terms of uh, frequency. Right. So if you can all you can make things more complicated, but the, but the problem is, so for instance, if we try to incorporate non-stationarity, non-Gaussianity, but the problem is, you know, you don't even know, you, it, it, it is not even, you don't even know over what time scale you want to characterize your detector, right? So if you want to characterize your detector over a time scale of half an hour, you'll get to a distribution like this. Suppose you instead characterize your uh, detector over a time scale of a minute, maybe you get a distribution that looks completely different, in fact, you don't. <laughs> um, so you, you can make, I mean, the, you can try to tackle the, the problem as a whole, but it, you will not get there in a finite amount, or uh, you will not get there before you know the data is actually there. Whereas this formula is probably about for the detection. <laughs> we simplify it. I, uh, it's finished. Over here, I just have one doubt. So this bracket S of T, that is integral S of T with yeah. 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 That's integral S of T with probability distribution of n, right? Yeah. Probability of n of t. Yeah. And then we are saying that n of t into tn of t dt will be zero. Yeah. So if you, uh, how can we go from there to just writing it as h of t? Ah uh, well, so um, you have that. Um, so you have that the expectation value, uh, the expectation value of s of t. So remember, little s is only the detector output. Right? So the expectation value of S of T is just expectation value of N of T plus, plus H of T, where H of T is just a signal that happens to be there. So since uh, expectation values, it's a linear thing, because you're just taking in the build against some function, you get this. But this first term is zero by assumption, because we assume that the noise is stationary in Gaussian. So this, this is zero. So I get expectation value of H of T. However, you know, uh, h of t is just a function. So I get h of t outside of, of the brackets. But inside the brackets, I have one with meaning 
the constant function that I integrate my uh, 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 probability density uh, for noise relaxation. So this is nothing but, so, so this part is simply equal to, well, um, integral over all noise realizations, I can now call the so succinctly write it like this, times one times probability distribution over noise realizations, which is just the same as writing this, but this has to be normalized, so this has a business right. Okay, so this is where we are so far, and um, I haven't done anything yet, right? I've, I've just taken my definitions and rewritten things in a form that I find more convenient. So again, the aim of the game is um, we, we have these definitions here, and we want to find the filter that maximizes the single-to-noise ratio in the case of the single expression. So we go up. So this is what we have so far. Again, we've only used definitions and we've written things in the forms that seem, seem more convenient. Um, so now, this is, this is a bit of a mess, right? So I have a, a, an integral of the Fourier transform of my signal against uh, complex conjugate, the Fourier, a Fourier transform of my filter, and then uh, something involving the noise power spectral density in uh, the denominator and so on. This is a bit of a mess and not so easy to human eyes, but we can simplify this by defining an inner product between functions. And this is something you will have done in quantum mechanics, so this, this will probably be familiar to you, except that the inner product that we will define here is going to be a little bit of an odd one, an unusual one. This is what it looks like. So I have two functions, a of b, which a priority, a priority can be uh, functions of time. And what is the inner product between them? Well, I take the Fourier transform of, of each, and I just multiply those Fourier transforms, the star is again complex conjugation. I divide by one half of my power spectral density, integrated over frequency, and I take the real part. It's a inner product. It's a bizarre looking one. And in fact, all of the happiness that is here will be hidden in the happiness that is the definition of the inner product, of course. But nevertheless, this allows us to write our signal to noise ratio in this way. And uh, this is a particularly interesting way. So basically, what do I have here? I have um, so I have uh, signal to noise ratio is equal to um, the inner product of uh, some k with h signal divided by square root of inner product of k with itself. Where this k, it, it is a function of course, I put a vector sign on top because you know, now we have an inner product in the space of functions, we can start thinking of the functions as if they were vectors. And this k here is just one half of the power spectral density, is, is a function of that. Uh, it's one half of the power spectral density times the Fourier transform of my filter. Okay, so it is what it is, it happens to be found. And so, this is what I get. Or, I can go one step further and define a unit vector. So, I define a k hat to be this vector k here, that is still on the slide, divided by the inner product of k to the sum that is a unit vector. And then I have that the signal to noise ratio is just the inner product of that unit, unit vector with the signal. Okay. Now, remember, as always, the, the aim of the game is to find the filter that maximizes the signal to noise ratio when a signal is actually present. Well, you have some fixed vector that you can't do anything about, and that is the signal. And you have the unit vector. And the signal-to-noise ratio is the inner product of that unit vector with my signal. The, uh, this, this unit vector here, I can do something about it because it involves my filter, so I can make choices there. What is the choice that I should make to optimize the SNR? I should make sure that this unit vector k hat points in the direction of h because then the, the inner product is, is maximum. So, we need to make k hat point in the same direction as h, so that means 
uh, the function k hat must be proportional to h, which means that k itself, my filter, is proportional to h. Uh, or the, this is not my filter, but both ways k and the case is proportional to h. This means that this quantity here, essentially the noise power of spectral density times the filter, must be proportional to h. And so I have found the filter that is optimal in the sense that I keep staying. So the optimal filter, the one that optimizes this, that, that maximizes the signal to noise ratio if the signal is present, is proportional to the Fourier transform of the signal divided by the noise power spectrum. And this quantity is called the reader filter because the circuit, Mr. Reader, is the one who first came up with it, or at least is present. So um, if we substitute this back into the expression for signal to noise ratio we have, then we have well the you know the maximum of that expression for signal to noise ratio, and it takes this form here. Now you see that this is quadratic in the signal, um, so you have in here you actually have one factor coming from the H of f that is actually in the data, and another factor is coming from the H of f that you're you're, you're, you're comparing, trying to compare with the data, right? So this is the, the optimal SNR you get also under the assumption that you, that you only ever expect one particular form for the signal, namely HFF. So either there's an HFF of a particular form present or it is not. And then this is the, the largest uh, signal to noise ratio you can get. Okay? Now, um, in practice, this is not, not something you can do, of course, because uh, in practice, you don't have any access to the expectation value of, of S. Remember, there's an expectation value here. We only have the actual detected output of S and E. Uh, also, waveforms, in reality, are not one definite particular wiggle. Uh, you know, they, they come in families, for instance, with compact binary coalescence, and they are uh, characterized by a whole bunch of source parameters. In the case of compact binary coalescence, those are component masses and spins and the distance and uh, the sky position and what, 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 whatever else you have. So, the filtering we actually do to construct a signal to noise ratio is as follows. So, we take our detector output and we filter it against it uh, a template waveform uh, and we normalize. Right? That, that is actually what it says here. So, I take my expression here, but instead of an expectation value of S, I put simply the detector output. Okay? And then I maximize this over all parameters, which is the same as saying, well, I'm going to take my data, and I'm going to use my optimal filter for many different choices of the parameters, corresponding to in, corresponding for binary black holes, to many different choices of masses there could be, and many different choices of sky position as we develop. So, um, okay, that, that is what I'm going to do. But then the next problem is, of course, uh, this maximum cannot be taken in practice in a continuous way. I have to choose particular places in parameter space where I'm going to generate a waveform, construct a filter, and integrate that filter against the data. In the parameter space can only be sampled in a discrete manner. And that, so a discrete sampling of parameter space, that is what we call a temporal time. And then the next problem, and that we have heard a number of times now, is that the noise is not perfectly Gaussian or stationary. And that is something we will have to do something about post facto. Uh, we keep working under the assumption, which goes into this expression here, that the noise is stationary in Gaussian. Um, and again, you know, we probably could have done something far more complicated and tried to capture uh, the physics that is actually in the detector, but I highly doubt that we would have arrived at uh, you know, uh, a declared detection um, uh, any sooner. But again, you know, all the things to do with uh, non-stationarity and non house <coughs> are things that we do have to take care, care of them uh, post time. And we go. Okay, so now... Um, so, uh, only the direction of the filter factor for like all the binary Well, in this uh, abstract space, um, it is the direction only that matters because I am looking at what is a unit vector, right? And I'm, I'm trying to, I'm rotating that so that it corresponds to the direction. Yeah. Please, um, 
the pattern of by saying that we just implicate S of T with H of T where H plus the wave form. Then we said we need something more generic than yes. that and we ended up something that is proportional to H. The only difference yes. is that's weighted by S of T. Yes, that's, that's right. right. Okay. Exactly. And you can also intuitively see why this is actually a good idea. So indeed, um, in the end, uh, what you do is you, you uh, integrate, for instance, you can see it here. Um, you integrate over the f, essentially, with the vector output times some template waveform in h of f and divided by Sn of f, the noise, spec the noise power spectral density. So why, why is that? In retrospect, actually, a good uh, a good thing to do. Why is that a good idea? Well, if I draw my SN of F again, again, frequency, it will always look like uh, some U shape or other. Um, what we want is for um, so in places where the noise is very, the noise is very bad, where we have barely any sensitivity. I I don't want too, too much contribution to the integral from those frequencies, and I want most of the contribution to my integral to come from, from frequencies where my detector is the most accurate. Because here and here, I'm filtering against Kraken. So why not? It's not an efficient thing to do. So that is, you know, the post facto intuitive explanation why this uh, power spectrum is this. Uh, this is this filter makes people think that Cancels the effect of this uh, particular uh, different way in the noise part which is exactly puts that factor in the uh, what well, it doesn't yeah okay yeah I see what you mean. So yeah. there's there's you know in reality there's a contribution from the noise right here and so in a sense you're widening your noise. Yes. That is what you mean. Uh, 
you've uh, made something you do with vector by normalizing. So this is the inner product of S with a template waveform divided by its, uh, its norm, which is uh, which is this. Right? Okay, so now what else do we have? Uh, but we have a bunch of stuff that is not particularly uh, relevant to the point I want to make. So let's see if I can make the point uh, more easily. Uh, yes, but for instance, um, forget about what the HC and the HS are. I can explain if you want. But the, the, the main point is the following. You have this, <coughs> so basically your, your template waveform is going to be some in the time domain. Now, again, uh, it's going to be some time dependent amplitude times the cosine of some phase or other. And the some phase or other is the phase actually you get from post newtonian calculations in the case of, of uh, just the inspiral waveform. The amplitude you also get from post newtonian calculations. However, we are not so sensitive to uh, amplitudes as compared to the phases. So for the phase in our template waveform, what we choose is just the leading post newtonian order in the beam. So what, the, what does um, um, uh, a typical waveform look like in terms of its amplitude? So let me just write here. Then, it looks like some function of, well, all sorts of extrinsic parameters, um, and also masses are in there, I, I should say, so it's not only extrinsic parameters, masses and, and spins even, times um, the instantaneous frequency to the power of two thirds. Okay, now, um, when I write again what I uh, just erased, if you take the inner product of your uh, detector output with a normalized version of your waveform, let me write h of t here, h of t times cosine of some phase. Now, if I, you know, filter my detector output against a normalized waveform, then in a sense, this information is erased. You know, it, 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 it gets reduced to some number. And of course, the time dependence here will still be important. However, this instantaneous, uh, instantaneous frequency as a function of time does not depend on extrinsic parameters. It only depends on the masses. And if present, the space. So in a sense, it, it is because of, um, it's because of taking this inner product against a normalized waveform. That is, in a sense, why you know, uh, all these extrinsic parameters, that is the sense in which these extrinsic parameters get, get absorbed into some overall p factor, and you don't have to, to uh, search over them separately with a template factor. Okay, so uh, having made that point, uh, let's go on. Then, oh yeah, you, you need some prescription, of course, for how you want to space your templates over your parameter space. So um, for that, it turns out to be some notion of metric of parameter space. Um, and then, well, okay, I'm not, I'm not going into too much detail, except to say that the metric is determined by the particular family of waveform you wish to employ. And then uh, here's an example that I showed earlier of an actual template bank. You see that, there's, that the templates are laid out more densely, for instance, at low masses. That is you know, explained by what I said yesterday. If you have low masses, and the waveforms are in band for much longer. You have many more cycles in band. So if you change the parameters a little bit, even if the waveforms are in phase to begin with, they get out of phase quite, dr quite drastically towards the end. So you want to be more careful here in phase that looks more dense. And then there were all these uh, extra checks that I was talking about. You need to uh, take into account that the noise does have glitches in it, which can pose as gravitational. Uh, so, for instance, here I give the distribution of signal-to-noise ratios to the signal detector. Uh, in the case that there is only Gaussian noise, you get this distribution here. Or in the case that, in the case of real data, you get this red distribution here, which has a huge tail that doesn't go so well. But if you do already just demanding that an event is seen in these two detectors, gets rid of much of the tail with some outliers uh, still present. Uh, then there was this chi-square uh, statistic that we also uh, wanted to employ, which is just like saying that, well, I, I want 
uh, to make sure that the buildup of signal to noise ratio over frequency is consistent with there actually being a signal in the data. So this is the more accurate version. I see a typo here. There should be HS, HS here. But anyway, you could read later. But uh, modulo that typo, this formula is the more exact version of the cartoon formula I wrote on the board yesterday. And so this, so the, the, the signal to noise ratio and the chi square together allow you to distinguish already between um, uh, signals and just pitches in the noise. In particular, for a given signal to noise ratio, a glitch in the noise will have a much larger chi square. Um, and then uh, you could do fancy though heuristic things, and they are done in your practice, uh, namely combining the signal to noise ratio and the chi square into one number, which you then fancily call the detection statistic. And if you do that cleverly, that your detection statistic will have a distribution uh, in real noise that is almost the same as its distribution in stationary Gaussian noise. And so, uh, in practice, Despite that, we started out with, 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 with rather, you know, dramatic assumptions like uh, stationarity and Gaussianity. In practice, in the end, you can deal with that. And so you don't have to do extremely fancy things. Um, it is a little bit uh, more work than just you know, writing down a signal to noise ratio, but uh, it is not uh, a, a gigantic effort you have to do. OK, and then there are other diagnostic tools like um, uh, 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 decomposition in uh, time and frequency, time frequency spectrogram, as we say. This is what the binary black hole signal looks, looks like in that case. So again, here you have time, here you have frequency, and you see something that chirps, right? This frequency increases monotonically. Uh, this is, uh, well, uh, a simulated signal for binary black holes, uh, but you know, the real signal would presumably uh, look more or less like this. So what does the color come? Uh, well, the color is simply how much uh, power, as in SNR, there is in a given tile. So you, you can imagine this being an enormous number of tiles in time and in frequency, and the brightness indicates how much SNR is being deposited at that time for that frequency. So this is for binary black holes. If you then do the same for uh, binary neutron stars, you get this, even when uh, a signal, uh, a detectable signal is present. And the reason is simply that in that case, uh, so again, if I have time and frequency, the reason is that in that case, uh, the signal uh, is much longer in duration. So for the same signal-to-noise ratio, um, this uh, signal-to-noise ratio gets spread out over a much larger surface area in the time frequency uh, plane. And so the, 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 the SNR surface density, or whatever I should should call it, but it's indicated by the, color, by the colors, is that much less. And visually, you can't see the signal. So uh, that is just you know, to say that uh, uh, it, won't, it won't be enough to look at high frequency spectrograms like that uh, to uh, make it. So in these cases, both the cases, is an average case fixed? The SNR is the same in both cases, except that in this case, it's a binary black hole. There is a binary black hole. So what matters? Oh, well, uh, here, oh, sorry, 1.4, 1.4, and this was actually neutron star black hole coalescence with 1.4 and, I'm going to say, third. Okay, so it's probably a mass, but it's still quite a lot of well. So in, in the case of uh, a low mass binary, much less of the signal is in band. So you, but, but, but so the only thing that's kept fixed here mm -hmm. is the signal to the and that needs to be distributed in some way or the other over time and frequency. And in the case of binary black holes, you see that you get well, a fairly compact region in time frequency space where SNR gets deposited, whereas in the binary neutron star case, it gets spread out. Yeah, I was saying, I think we have to go to say, the five to five to almost a quarter the neutron star case. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you reduce the, the total mass here, uh, sorry, if you increase the total mass in going from here, you will end up eventually at the sea and stuff. Like that. Yeah. Um, well, it's already quarter to 12, and the rest I have was just for fun, in a sense. Let me, well, let me read it. So this is the, the whole summary of how you do detections, but let me not uh, worry about that yet. Is there any reference that you can give? 
backlash, all this thing. Yes, like, you know, yeah, I, I can do that later. So anyway, uh, in 2010, September 16th, uh, this universal time, two, the two LIPO detectors that were active at that time detected a signal with uh, this uh, detection statistic that I sketched earlier of 12 and a half, or at least a combined statistic. So in the Hanford, LIPO Hanford detector, something was seen with a signal to noise ratio of 15, in fact, and then a chirp method 4.7. In the Livingston detector, something was seen with a single to, uh, single to noise ratio of 10. And then in Virgo, at that time, there was no trigger above threshold. That we saw. <coughs> Very exciting. So then uh, people sketched out, well, uh, how, you know, if, if this signal was really, uh, if this signal was real, how uh, did the uh, signal evolve uh, in the food? Well, let, let me skip this slide. Uh, then what was the significance of the event? Well, the false alarm rate was calculated. It turned out to be less than one in 7,000 years. Going on still. Um, instrumental validation, well, the time frequency spectrogram was made, and actually in the previous slides, you could, in this case, see the signal in both Hanford and Livingston. Okay. So then you want to know, well, uh, what's the, the, the time, so in the time around where the apparent signal was, was the detector data clean? Yes, it was. Here's the signal again. And then here you see, well, what looks like nothing. And then some seconds before the signal, there was a huge glitch. This is not an inspired signal. This is just, just an instrumental glitch, which subsequently was understood where it came from. So this looked all very promising. You could also do things like, okay, so the waveform that gives you the highest SNR, if you subtract that from uh, a high frequency spectrogram, what do you get? Um, well, here's the signal. If you subtract, you get something like this, or it looks like some noise was still present on the game. Uh, oh no, this is actually what you got. So this was, this was Ham the signal in Hanford, the signal in Livingston. In both cases, you subtract uh, from the data the waveform that gave the highest SNR. And this is what you get. So, well, apparently, uh, this isn't with there being just normal amounts of noise. But it wasn't real. Really this was a so called blind hardware injection. And this is something that people occasionally do. So, what is a blind hardware injection? So, you take your detector and you deliberately shape the mirrors in such a way that at the output it will seem as if the signal is present. And nobody stole. Okay. Uh, only a few people in the collaboration know that this went on, although everybody is, is aware that it might have, have, have been done. So uh, the reason for, for doing blind hardware injections is on the one hand to check that the data analysis algorithms are working properly and all this, this stuff I've been telling you about SNR, signal consistency, chi square and so on, whether it all works. But there's a other second and more important reason, and that is that people can keep their mouths shut. And so what, why is that relevant? It's well known. But why is that relevant? The, the issue is that if we see something that really looks like a signal, then of course we will want to validate in any which way we can, right? Uh, we, want, we even want to look for electromagnetic counterparts, maybe ask uh, in, a, in a hushed way uh, our fellow uh, astronomers whether they saw something uh, at the same time, and so on. And it's, it's going to take some time. We're aiming for three months between uh, a very promising detection candidate being identified, and then three months later, you want a paper draft, okay? But even for a day, you cannot keep people silent, and they'll, they'll talk to their wives and, uh, or husbands, and the spouse happens to know a journalist uh, who works for, I don't know, New Scientist or Scientific American, and a week later, you know, New Scientist has a front page article, gravitational wave discovery. We don't want that to happen, right? Because we want to be extremely careful. Um, and so that is that is actually the main reason why uh, blind hardware injections are done. Uh, you know, if people excitedly start talking to each other and the colleagues over here in the elevator and the spouse uh, knows about it and so on, there is plausible deniability it might be a blind hardware injection. Okay. Uh, so this is what that was. Uh, it wasn't a signal, but better luck if it doesn't end. Yes? How plausible deniability that other yeah. So uh, what you do is you use magnets uh, that 
that, 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 uh, that apply forces to the mirrors. In fact, that is how we keep the mirrors in, in uh, all, relative to the same place at all times, right? And so, uh, by using those magnets, not to keep the mirror in place, but doing the opposite, you can inject the same mirror. So, you change the current in the magnet to reduce it? Yeah. And you put it in both the uh, arms and yeah, also the simultaneous at yeah, both the sides? Yes. You even you even get the same as five position, right? yeah. and, and you even uh, uh, cause time simulated time delays between the elements. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Krishna has same process. Uh, Sorry, for both it does the injectors in your same like uh, yeah. It was a different yeah. estimation. Yes, yeah, so the inverted parameters were the same in all three detectors actually, uh, and there was a, a, a fixed sky position, and yes, the injectors were made in such a way that they were consistent with the real sky. So did you estimate the M1 and M2 for the system? Yeah. So what is the, so what is the, so you said the M, uh, total mass of 4.4? Uh, the the, the, the short mass was okay, so 4.7 and so on. Unfortunately, uh, I think this is in the public record, so I can, okay. so I can, I can say it. Unfortunately, something extremely embarrassing, well, two embarrassing things. One embarrassing thing that wasn't so bad was that uh, the signal, in one of the detectors, the signal was injected Sign, so it was inverted, and so this this uh, this supposed signal was called the big dog because it seemed to be coming from the constellation big dog, famous uh, major. Uh, but actually, if that sign error had not been there, it would have been somewhere else entirely. Okay, so that was one error, maybe not such a big one. A bigger error was this was unfortunate. Um, a, a particular waveform was uh, ejected from a, a waveform family that is known to be pathological. And so people were searching with waveforms that are perfectly okay and not pathological, and then found, even with detailed parameter estimation, found masses that totally didn't correspond to what was okay. okay. People make mistakes and we've So you can identify the beginning before coming with open by the current estimation group or something like that? No, no, it was first identified with the usual protection effort. And next comes parameter estimation, but that was also done subsequently. Yeah, that's true, but uh, could they find that there is some uh, unphysical thing here? Or? Um, no, unfortunately not. Uh, I suspect that had there been a, a search pipeline or search algorithm for testing relativity at the time, it would have found the GR oh, that's good. But it wasn't there. Uh, in the previous slide, one of the slides, yeah, it said the falls around weight is less than one, is seven or one. Yeah. So is this good? If, if this actually does not, so is this a good or estimate? Um, right now, I can't tell you how that would translate into sigmas. Um, I think it was not quite five sigma, but it's pretty good. Yes. <coughs> Believable. But this, this would have been covered. Yeah, that Virgo was taking data at that time? Virgo was taking data, but uh, the trigger was below the threshold. So Virgo has, has somewhat less <coughs> sensitivity because of the shorter arms. And uh, so it wasn't uh, identified. However, uh, in parameter estimation, it was dug out. So with parameter estimation, you also get a sense for whether there is a signal or not. Right? And I'll go into that. There it was identified as a very probable signal. And this figure was shared with the astronomy community? Or? Uh, he, yes, there was a follow up with Zapro and a number of uh, other uh, people who had found out. We also have uh, software injections or only hardware injections? Also software injections, yes. And so which one from the team is better? Oh, uh, the software injections are much preferred. Uh, software injections, they can be. You, you can do as many as you like, uh, and, and that is actually a much better way of, of characterizing the quality of your software. Um, uh, uh, you, you will always retain the original data, right? Uh, so the software injections are only added at the moment that we start analyzing and so on. Whereas a hardware injection is a very invasive thing. It essentially destroys that part of the data in terms of having any hope of finding a real signal. So it's a very invasive thing that is done in terms of. Yes, yes, a lot of 
Yeah, yeah. 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 you could you know, the injection family or something crazy, you could detect the signal. Even if yeah. 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 That, that is actually a good thing that came out of yeah. despite that the reform making no sense at all. Okay, that's what I got for uh, this morning.